Welcome to this first Westmead County Council Decade of Centenaries podcast, supported by the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gwailtocht, Sport and Media. The title of this episode is The Lives and Deaths of James and Joseph Tormey of Moat. It centres on the story of two brothers from South West Mead, both members of the Irish Republican Army during the Irish War of Independence, who were killed within a matter of weeks of each other in early 1921. Along with another moat man, Patrick Sloan, the younger Tormey brother, Joseph, was shot dead by a British sentry at Ballykinler internment camp in County Down on January the 17th. Just over a fortnight later, on February the 2nd, James Tormey died in an engagement with Crown forces near Athlone. My name is Paul Hughes, historian in residence with Westmead County Council, and joining me for this podcast is John Sheehan, senior lecturer in the Department of Archaeology at University College Cork. John, who is a son of one of Westmead's greatest local historians, the late Jeremiah Sheehan, specialises in historical archaeology, mainly from the Viking period. In 2017, John was engaged to write an article for the highly acclaimed Cork University Press publication, The Atlas of the Irish Revolution, and looking to his native Westmeath, decided to tell the tragic story of the Tormey brothers and to place their deaths within a broader context. So, John, you're based in Cork and archaeology is your primary field, but yet you've, you've written this wonderful piece on two tragic figures, I suppose, at the heart of the story of Westmead's Irish Revolution. Can you maybe explain to us your own connections to Westmead and how you came to write the story of James and Joseph Tormey? Yeah, Paul. Um, well, of course, I am from Westmead. I, I was born and raised in Moat, uh, and I was there until, as a young man, I, I, went, I went to college uh, and so on. And I have a very distinct memory as a very young child, uh, and I'm certain it must have been in 1966 uh, at Easter, uh, my father bringing me down to a public event outside the courthouse in Moat, uh, where uh, an event was taking place to commemorate those who had died on the 50th anniversary of the Rising. And I also uh, strongly recall a young guy, I'd say he was 15 or 16 years of age, reading the proclamation and asking my father, who was he? Uh, and he told me he was one of the Tormies. Uh, and it suddenly began to connect with me that the Tormy brothers were not just historic figures, but there was still a Tormy family uh, in Moat, some of whom uh, later on I went to school with. Um, so I've always been sort of interested in them. And when Cork University Press decided to publish the Atlas of the Irish Revolution, uh, because I'd been involved in some other works with them, they asked me, was there anything from my part of the world I'd like to write? And of course, the Tormy brothers immediately came to mind. Okay, so you mentioned Moat, uh, John, and, and your native of Moat. Uh, maybe you can, you can set the scene for us. Uh, Moat around 1914, what it was like, and maybe the backdrop to uh, to James Tormey in particular, his decision to join the Connacht Rangers and to fight in World War One. Yeah, well, Moat during World War One um, would have been first of all, it's a town that supplied lots of soldiers uh, for uh, the uh, British Army, which isn't surprising when you think of it. It's sort of located within a triangle of Mullingar, Athlone and Tullamore, each of which is a strong military um, base of, of one sort uh, or another at that time. And also um, there was a lot of um, public support for uh, Britain in World War I. There were recru recruitment drug drives going on. They came to Moat. Um, Liam Cox, uh, the late Liam Cox, a local historian, did write about a major event that took place in 1917, when for the first time a movie was shown in Moat. And it was a British Army movie about uh, recruitment into the forces. It was put, it was shown on a very large white sheet that was tacked to Galvin's shop, uh, which is across from St. Patrick. 
church. Uh, we know that there were large crowds there. There was a military band. The band played nationalist tunes like Schlieg Le uh, and so on. And they were trying to rouse up the crowd in Moat uh, to join the British Army. So that was part of the scene that perhaps James Tormey and the likes of James Tormey would have been growing up with and visiting. But of course, they also, um, at that time, Ireland being very religious, they would have all gone to uh, mass and so on. And they would have heard Canon Langan, who was a major ecclesiastical figure in Moat, encouraging people to join the British Army. In fact, we have a record of him standing on a timber recruitment platform outside Mount Temple Church, uh, encouraging the people from Mount Temple to join. But at the other end of the town, you had the Carmelite Order, and they were different. Uh, they were organizing novenas against conscription uh, to the British Army. So there may have been a bit of confusion uh, within the town, but certainly the British were very successful in getting lots of people uh, from Moat and the surrounding area to, to join. But the other uh, point, Paul, is that Moat also had a tradition of nationalism, uh, which was always there, it was always a strong undercurrent. Uh, for instance, Peter Mohan uh, was a Fenian who was sent to uh, prison in Britain uh, for 10 years uh, because of his uh, activities there during the Fenian uprising. And eventually he was released in 1871 on one condition, and that is that he not go back to Ireland. Uh, so he went to Arkansas and he, he was buried there. And then you had John Keegan Casey, the famous poet and songwriter uh, from Ballymore, uh, who wrote The Rising of the Moon and many, many other songs. Again, a Fenian uh, with Moat connections. Uh, and then you had shootings on the street in Moat in the 1880s, connected with the Land League. Uh, Mooney of the Dune and John Law were both shot uh, on the main street in Moat in, in, at that time. So what I'm saying is that there was two strands, two, two uh, streams of consciousness, if you like, when it came to politics and nationality and so on in Moat. You had the old nationalist one, which was always there, and then you had the dominant one, uh, which was Ireland being part of Britain. But before World War I, there, you know, there already was the Celtic revival going on, uh, and it's interesting that in 1912, uh, a slew of Fianna Aaron this youth body, uh, a very nationalistic one. There were only 25 branches founded in Ireland by 1912, and one of them was in Moat. Uh, I don't know why, uh, but again, it indicates that there was a strong nationalist background, uh, as well as one that supported um, Britain. Okay. And James specifically himself, he joined 5th Battalion, is that correct, the Connacht Rangers? Uh, That's right. A fairly storied unit. Um, can you tell us a bit about his military service and maybe then his career leading up to when he joined the IRA? Um, I think it's true to say he straddled both sides of the county in, in a professional sense. Absolutely, yeah. Um, we don't we know very little about James. We we have he appears on the 1911 census as a as a child living in, with his parents in a patched house of three rooms. There were 11 of them living in the house. So obviously the father, by the way, was an agricultural labor. So they weren't uh, well off. Uh, and after that, the next official record we have of him is when he joins the Connacht Rangers in February, 1915. And he signed up in Athlone and then was shipped to Galway for the following day, uh, he formally uh, joined uh, the regiment. And of course, like lots of other young Irish men at the time, he lied about his age. Uh, he was only 15, uh, but he said he was, for some reason, he came up at the age 18 years and 11 months. Uh, and that's what he put down uh, on the uh, application form. Uh, and he was accepted, sent for training, I think in the south of England, but ultimately ended up in Gallipoli, uh, that um, horrible uh, battlefield where the Connacht Rangers suffered uh, huge casualties, 70% casualties, 22% of them were fatalities. And of course, the whole Gallipoli campaign was a total failure because the Turks uh, took the field uh, at the uh, time. He was there. Um, unfortunately, we don't know how he did 
uh, there of what he saw. Uh, we do know from other accounts that it was a, a horrific place to be. Uh, large amounts of dead bodies and lots of dead horses all over the place. Rats, trenches, terribly hot weather, shortages of water, all of that sort of thing. Uh, but it must have induced some sort of post-traumatic stress disorder in everybody uh, who was there, including James. Um, but the following year, March 1916, uh, he was discharged. Um, he was discharged because they had discovered that when he signed up the previous year, he had given false information uh, about his age. Uh, but one thing I've just noted is that his parents, particularly his father, had been writing to the British Army, telling them uh, that he was underage and that he shouldn't be in uh, Gallipoli. So it may have been his father that alerted the British authorities, uh, but they did, did uh, discharge him. And he came back to Ireland, March 1916, one month before the Easter Rising. And of course, he was coming back to a different uh, sort of place from, from the one he left just a year earlier. Okay. So uh, if we, we fast forward, where, where, do, where do Joseph, and both Joseph and James, I suppose, take us between the Rising and, and the War of Independence? Um, again, we don't know a huge amount about them. James, back from Gallipoli, probably because he had served in the British Army, um, got a job. Um, and he got a good job. It would have been a job that uh, many young men of his background would, would have been delighted to get uh, at the time. Uh, and that was, he was an attendant uh, in the uh, Nourishik Asylum in Mullingar, which was a huge uh, operation, lots of jobs. If you look at um, what is required uh, to get that job, you have to be of sober habits, you have to be tall and strong and physically uh, active. And of course, we know that he was tall and strong. Um, the indication is he probably was pretty sober uh, as well. And he got the job there as uh, an attendant. But interestingly, um, we know that very early on, um, he was active in the trade union movement uh, in Mullingar, where he was now uh, based. And he also seems to have been, although I have no direct evidence for it early on, but he seems to have joined the Labour Party. Uh, and again, we think back, Jim, James Connolly, the founder of the Labour Party, had just been shot a couple of years earlier. And so it was, and, and it was a, quite a militant party at the time. So perhaps it's not surprising that Tommy joined Labour rather than Sinn Féin, which was the other uh, up and coming uh, rising party at the time. It's actually so it's a, it's a, hu it's a huge with. question as to, to what extent Labour and, and the trade union movement overlapped with the IRA uh, during, during these years. Absolutely. There was close connections, uh, close connections there in Athlone and Mullingar and certainly throughout the country uh, as well. Um, later on in 1920, he ran for Labour. Uh, for um, Mullingar Town Council, and he got elected. Uh, and he's down in his nominations paper as James Tormey, Mullingar Lunatic Asylum attendant. Uh, but he got elected, and he was chosen uh, to go on the board of the Lunatic Asylum. And um, when you were elected to the Town Council, you were put on various boards, and he was given that one, again, presumably because of his connection with it. But also at that time, uh, to show, again, his nationalist uh, background. Uh, he was put on a subcommittee that was set up to uh, rename the streets of Mullingar. Um, they wanted to take the names of the old Anglo-Irish ascendancy off them and put on names like Pierce and Connolly and Emmett and so on uh, on it. And James served on that committee. Right. And of course, around this time, uh, he would have joined the IRA or the Irish Volunteers, as, as they were initially. Um, he became uh, OC of the Athlone Brigade Flying Column around August 1920, I think. Uh, around this time, the War of Independence was only kicking off in Westmead, and there was certainly an immediate upsurge in violence in the greater Athlone area uh, between then and November. What, what kind of a leader was James Tormey at this time, and how did his, his military experience count 
Well, the, the Bureau of Military History statements, several of them mention him. And generally what they say about him is very positive. They say he's a tall, uh, outstanding man of military uh, stance and so on. Uh, they say he was very uh, decisive. Um, he's described in one of them as a natural leader uh, and so on. So of course, with his military background, it's not surprising they, that they began to use James uh, for training uh, purposes. Uh, but also, uh, he did get involved in action uh, fairly early on uh, with the uh, Athlon Brigade. There were various uh, attacks uh, taking place. For instance, the first RIC barracks in West Mead uh, that was occupied while it was attacked was Streamstown in July 1920, and James was very much uh, at the forefront uh, of that. Uh, he also was involved in the killing of a senior RIC man in Athlone, uh, who was considered to be um, supplying information to Dublin Castle, particularly about Southwest Mead and the uh, IRA columns uh, there and so on. And of course, uh, he was uh, in charge of the Parkwork, Parkwood ambush uh, just between Moat and Harsley, uh, which um, was a success from an IRA point of view in that they got no uh, casualties, uh, but it inflicted casualties uh, on the British. And it gave the British quite a shock uh, to lose somebody uh, in a gun battle. Uh, in southwest Mead, and they ran riot that night uh, through Moat, Kilbegan, Athlone. They were shooting left, right, and centre. They were burning. Uh, they actually shot um, a, a former um, councillor in Athlone who just happened to stick his head out the door at the wrong time. Uh, there was a child uh, called Matthews shot in the neck in Moat. She again was on the street at the wrong time. There was an old man called Pat Bastic, who was deaf, who apparently didn't hear them when they were calling on him to halt. So he was shot, uh, but he survived. He was shot in the shoulder and so on. So there was mayhem in, in Moat, Kilbegan and Athlone that night because of the reprisals uh, that followed the Parkwood ambush. But of course, by then, James Tarney and those who were with him um, had gone um, very cleverly south of Moor, through the bogs, reached the Shannon, and were in South Roscommon uh, in safe houses. And so it was a very successfully well-planned uh, operation, uh, and one that he is um, well-remembered uh, for. Maybe switching away from James for a minute, uh, we probably uh, it's probably fair to say we know less about Joseph, uh, apart from uh, the, the, the final months of his life, and that, that kind of catalogue of misfortune, which led to his, his death in, in Ballykinner internment camp in January 1921. Can you, can you maybe fill, fill in that gap for us and, and bring us as far as that, as that tragedy? Yeah. Well, we know a little uh, about him. He was two years younger than James. Um, he worked uh, on the railways, uh, I think in Moat Station or along the stretches leading up to Moat. I'm not quite sure what his job was, but there were many young men working on the railways in those days. Uh, he was active like his older brother. There are some hints in the Bureau of Military History statements that James tried to keep him distant from some of the activities because he was very young. He was about 16 uh, around this time. But we do know that he was at Streamstown. He was at that attack on the RIC barracks. But again, he seems to be more in a support role uh, in the background. Uh, but obviously, uh, the authorities were aware of him. They knew that he was involved in some way, obviously, because uh, he was James Tarmy's brother. He probably was a bit of a target as well. So eventually, he was arrested in November uh, 1920 under the Restoration of Order and Ireland Act, which, of course, meant that effectively he was uh, interned. And he was sent to Ballykindler, which is the largest internment camp in Ireland, uh, up in County Down. Uh, he wasn't alone up there. Um, there was other uh, people from Westmead, uh, including Patrick Sloan, uh, who was from just out the road uh, towards uh, Mount Temple. And it was with Patrick Sloan uh, 
uh, when a couple of months later in January, the middle of January, he was talking with Patrick Stone when the, that famous uh, event took place, which um, resulted in the death of the two of them. And what, what kind of a reaction was there to his death, I, I suppose, uh, at home and there in, in, in your piece in the Atlas, you mention uh, where you talk about a kind of a martyrology that developed around him with his, his fellow prisoners? Yeah, I suppose the death of Tommy and Sloan on that day was different. You know, they weren't in action. They were in prison. They were safe and secure. Uh, and yet both of them uh, were shot uh, with one single bullet, by the way. The bullet uh, went through Tommy's head and out the other side and then uh, into the neck of Sloan. So both of them died fairly instantaneously uh, with uh, the one bullet that was fired by an uneasy sentry, uh, it seemed. Uh, it happened in broad daylight. You know, they weren't trying to escape. There was none of this. So it shocked everybody else in the camp who witnessed it. It was about mid-morning uh, that it took place. And again, because what was written uh, about the killing, mainly by a fellow called Louis Walsh, uh, he was an Antrim solicitor and he was also a Sinn Féin counsellor. Uh, and he was an internee as well. Uh, and he was there the morning of the shooting. Yeah, he wrote a book uh, called On My Keeping and In Theirs. And it was published the following year. So less than 12 months after Tommy and Sloan were shot, this eyewitness account was published. And it's quite detailed uh, about what Louis Walsh saw. So we have that account and we have various other ones. So we know what happened. We know that, for instance, a young internee called James Keevney, he was a Donegal man, ran over uh, to Tommy and Sloan. And when he saw they were dead, he took out his handkerchief, a white handkerchief, and he dipped it in their blood to keep it as a memento. Um, and I first became aware of this because his granddaughter uh, was uh, a senator uh, in uh, Sh Shannon Air. And in 2006, during a museum's debate, she mentioned this and how her father still had this. So I tracked her down and I, I contacted her and I said, where is the handkerchief now? Uh, and unfortunately, uh, somebody died and the house was cleared out and the handkerchief was lost. So it's a great uh, loss. But that idea about dipping a handkerchief in somebody's blood yeah. um, is actually a very old one. Father Murphy at Boulevard, uh, people ran up with pieces of linen and dipped it in his blood. Robert Emmett in 1803, after his execution, people were doing the same thing. Michael Collins, uh, when he was shot, people were using swabs and rubbing the blood off and, and keeping those swabs. And then you have James Connolly's shirt on display in the National Museum with its uh, blood stains. And even more recently, um, Bishop Daly on Bloody Sunday in Derry, uh, with that white handkerchief that he was waving as he was trying to get a young shot man to safety. Uh, it became covered in blood, and it's now on display in the Museum of Free Derry. So there's a strong tradition in Ireland, but also outside of Ireland, for that sort of memento. Uh, and that's one of the more important mementos that uh, derive from that. But there were also little wooden crosses put up at the place uh, where the shooting took place. A guy called James Lawler, he was from Kilkenny. He was an internee. He did watercolors. And he painted a very nice watercolor off the camp, uh, showing the two crosses and marking the spot where Sloan and Tommy had been shot. He also put in an Irish tricolor and two uh, wreaths. And that is now on display in the National Museum. It's a lovely, lovely uh, watercolor. And again, the whole idea, the martyrology of them, as you put it, continued on. Uh, for some reason, the following year in Temple Oak in Dublin, a new GA club was founded, and it was called the Tarney Sloan GA Club. I'd love to know why. I've been on to the Croke Park Museum, but unfortunately, they don't have any background information. Was it that there were some Moat people or Westmead people living in Temple Oak behind the setting up of that club? But it certainly was playing games in the Dublin Championship for a few years afterwards, and then it seems to uh, disappear. So there were various things like that, both physical things like the paintings and the crosses and the, um, the handkerchief, and also the written account of 
because it was deeply shocking. And of course, the Tormey family back in Moat when they heard the news uh, that Joe had been um, shot. Uh, and of course, the difficulty of getting the body back to Moat. It took six days uh, before it arrived. And then you had the funeral. Uh, he was buried out in Mount Temple, uh, and the British Army sent uh, a lot of soldiers to the cemetery, and they also followed the funeral out. Uh, there was a certain amount of intimidation and so on uh, that went on. And also his younger brother, David, who I think was only about 15, was arrested at the funeral and taken into custody. So it was a terribly traumatic uh, occasion for them. And James, two years older than, than him, as far as I know, could not attend the funeral. At least there is no record that he was at it. Presumably because he knew if he did turn up, uh, he'd be target number one. Um, so that whole event was a blow to the family. Uh, and of course, it didn't, they didn't know that less than three weeks later, the whole thing was going to be uh, repeated. Yes. Um, and that there'd be another funeral. Because that kind of feeds into my next question. That trauma um, fed, fed into something uh, really profound for James. Uh, can you tell us about his state of mind as a as a guerrilla leader at the time and how it how it changed after that in, incident and how it basically led to his own demise at Cornerfulla a few weeks later? Yeah, um, we know that. Joe was the next brother, you know, he was two years younger than James. Uh, and from the written accounts, the bureau statements, several of uh, those who wrote about it said that the death of his brother upset him very seriously. Some of them say he became very impatient, that he got overly anxious, uh, in that he was seeking revenge for the death of his brother. Uh, one of them said that he became reckless for revenge. So in other words, it seems based on these snippets of sentences that James reacted very badly to the killing of his brother. He decided he wanted revenge and he wasn't being very careful or cautious about how he went uh, to uh, plan that out. Uh, in another uh, bureau statement, it is said that he said that he would shoot 10 British forces in revenge for his brother. So obviously uh, he wanted uh, to um, seek revenge and he doesn't appear to have been in a good state of mind. Eventually it came just a few weeks later at Cornerfulla on the Roscommon side uh, of Athlone um, where there was a strong uh, volunteer base. Uh, James decided to attack uh, RIC who were coming back from uh, picking up their pay. And he threw together a very hastily organized ambush. Uh, he only had four, well, including himself, there were four involved in it. There was himself, George Adamson, his friend uh, from Moat, and the two Halligans, who were two Tom Halligans, I think they were cousins. They were from the Roscommon side. Uh, and the idea was that they would set up an ambush, attack uh, the policemen. They assumed it would be eight policemen uh, who were traveling from Athlone and that you know, it would be eventful. However, uh, what happened on the day was more policemen were on that column than was expected. It seems, and it's a bit confused, it seems that it was decided to let them pass and not to ambush them. But then James Tarmy stood up and, and lifted his rifle and started firing. And nobody knows why, because of course he was dead a short time later. So did he lose it? Uh, was it that he was under so much strain uh, and stress, going way back to Gallipoli, right up to the death of his brother a couple of weeks earlier? But he certainly didn't seem to act properly as he would in that situation. So he started firing. Of course, the RIC began to fire back, and then a column of black and tans on bicycles appeared around the corner. They had been uh, following the RIC. So there was more uh, shooting. They were in a bad ambush uh, position, uh, but they did begin to do a tactical withdrawal. But during that, uh, James Tarmy got shot in the head uh, and died uh, instantly. Um, and 
that was it probably wouldn't have happened a month earlier or two months earlier because he'd have been more tactical in how he approached things yeah remarkably uh, the crown forces um weren't actually aware that they had been looking for him they weren't actually aware initially that they had killed him um can you tell us a bit more about the aftermath of his death and and yeah. the the complicated circumstances of his burial yeah yeah they, they knew they had shot somebody that day but they, they had withdrawn they weren't sure how big the attacking party was so they pulled back to Athlone. but they knew they had drawn blood if you like so later on that day they went out looking for the body but that gave enough time for the local volunteers uh, to go back and collect James Tarney's body. And there are several accounts written about it uh, because it was rough enough ground. It's quite close to the banks of the Shannon, quite marshy. At that time of the year, February, it would have been great anyway. So they took the door off a shed uh, and they put his body on that and they carried that until they got to a road where they were managed to get a donkey and cart and they transferred him onto that and they brought him down to uh, the Shannon. And then he was put on a boat uh, and he was brought across uh, the Shannon uh, to the Westmead side, uh, where he was put in a turf shed uh, in the bog for the night. So in a sense, they had um, recovered uh, his body uh, and brought it back uh, to uh, safety. Uh, but of course, they then had to bury it. Uh, and that wasn't going to be uh, simple because the RIC knew that they, they had uh, shot somebody. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the RIC and the Black and Tans came back uh, to Cornafulla. Uh, there were reprisals. There were several people dragged out of their houses and very, very badly uh, beaten, one of whom died uh, a couple of months later. Uh, there were houses burnt and so on. They were looking for the body and they couldn't find it. And I assume they were also looking for information. Who did they shoot? Do you know? Um, you know, they perhaps knew, they perhaps had picked up uh, that Tormy was there and he would have been a big target for them because he was a thorn in their uh, sides. Um, meanwhile, uh, in Athlone, the common man women managed to approach a friendly undertaker uh, who agreed to deliver a coffin to them in a boat down on the Shannon that night. And under darkness, that coffin was brought down to the turf shed where Tommy's body lay. There is a very nice account written about how he was waked that night. Uh, there were 10 volunteers in the shed and a number of common among women who washed the body, laid him into the coffin, prayers were said and all of that. And then later on after midnight, uh, the coffin was put on a turf boat and brought down to Tom McNoise, uh, a place that Tommy would have had no connections with, really. Uh, but it perhaps was perceived as a safe place to bury him because it was a good distance away from where uh, the events uh, had taken place. Uh, so he was buried there in Tom McNoise. And I assume um, that the volunteers felt that was the end of that, that, that you know, he, he, he was gone. But the a couple of days later, um, the Crown forces got information from somewhere that there was an unusual burial had taken place in Tomac Noise. Now, whether it was an informer or good police worker or whatever, I don't know. Uh, but they sent a couple of lorry loads uh, out to Tomac Noise and they dug up uh, the grave and they were able to identify very quickly that this is the man he had been shot in the head. They connected it. Uh, to what had happened with Colonel Fuller, and the coffin was lifted out of the grave, put back on a crossly tender, and according to one account, the blackened hands sat on the coffin and sang body songs as they drove back into uh, Athlone. And they sent to Mort for his father, uh, who was a pretty elderly man at this stage, to bring him to Athlone to identify the body. Uh, so Tommy identified the body uh, of his uh, son, and um, it was the, the body was then handed back. There was an inquest held. Uh, the usual result of the inquest was that uh, he was shot 
by the armed forces in the execution of their duty, which is sort of the standard form that you get. But the body was then released to the family. And there's some very interesting accounts in the Westmead Examiner, February 12th, 1921, of the funeral, because it seems to have been a huge um, event. Um, the first thing is the, uh, the British allowed IRA prisoners to carry his coffin from the morgue uh, in Victoria Barracks, custom barracks as it is today, uh, to the gate. And there, the prisoners handed over the coffin uh, to the family. And at the gate, uh, the family and supporters wrapped uh, what was called a Republican flag, so I assume it was a tricolour, uh, around the coffin. And the coffin then was followed up to uh, St. Peter's Church. And then you had the old style solemn requiem high mass. According to the Westmead Examiner, the streets of Athlone were lined by thousands uh, of people. Uh, all the shops were closed, all business uh, suspended as the funeral passed uh, through. Um, just as with his brother a few weeks earlier, uh, there were lorries with fully armed British soldiers, one of them flying the Union Jack, which was a bit provocative, uh, but they joined in uh, the funeral cortege on its way out to uh, Mount Temple. And that Mount Temple, the burial took place, again, according to the Westmead Examiner, the tricolour was buried with the remains, which all of us struck me as very odd. Uh, under normal circumstances, the flags are recovered and not buried uh, with uh, the coffin. But in this case, of the paper, uh, they were. Uh, there were a lot of wreaths uh, laid uh, after it, coming among the Athlone Company of the Volunteers and various uh, other uh, bodies. So the funeral was over then. But of course, that's when people realized the graveyard had been surrounded uh, by British Crown forces and every male uh, at the funeral was searched and harassed to some extent before uh, they were uh, released. So, um, so he was buried alongside his brother um, in the same grave that had been opened just uh, three weeks earlier. And it seems to have been a massive, massive uh, event. Now, we, I suppose finally, John, we we we've spoken earlier about uh, memory and how uh, how uh, you know the likes of James and and Joe Tormey are are remembered years after after these events. Um, you mentioned two things, I suppose. Uh, you mentioned in your piece that uh, there was a sort of ecumenism about how they were buried and who they were buried beside. Um, uh, you might comment on that uh, briefly, and also, uh, how uh, are there are there any other ways they've been remembered locally? Um, I I know I believe they've been immortalized in song. The interesting thing about uh, the grave, Paul, is that the following year, George Adamson, who was a close friend of James Tarney, and of course another mortman, uh, was shot in strange circumstances in Athlone yes. and uh, killed. Uh, now, he was um, he was shot during that period leading up to uh, the, the treaty. So it was a, a strange sort of a time. Uh, and when it was decided to bury him uh, along with the Tormies in the same grave, uh, now with the benefit of, of hindsight, um, it, it was a very unusual decision. Because in Ireland, um, free state soldiers uh, were not buried in the Republican plots of the pre truce volunteers. But here we have a case where all three of them are buried in the same plot. And I've been thinking about this. In fact, I interviewed a man in Mount Temple uh, whose father uh, remembers it well. He was involved in grave digging at the time. And he said, yeah, definitely they were buried together uh, in this one plot. I thought that maybe the monument covered them all and it was in the one plot, but they were buried separately. But that is not the case. So it might have been a, a sort of ecumenism uh, because it was before the Civil War started. So it might have been an attempt by those who were uh, in favor of the treaty to try and bring both sides together by burying Adamson with the Tarmies. That's possible. But there's another little element of ecumenism as well. 
uh, in that that cemetery only has one World War I British Army um, burial, and it's right beside the Tormey graves. The headstone is next door almost to the Tormey and Adamson uh, monument. So there is, a, they, they all died within a couple of years of one another, uh, and there is this closeness there, which I think is, is um, strange. Now, of course, the Tormeys, you're talking about memory, the Tormeys have never been uh, forgotten. Uh, there are monuments to them, you know, there's the famous monument in Moat, there's another monument in Carnafulla uh, that was actually unveiled by Adamson the following year, the year after Tormey died. There's the general monument in Athlone, is named on the monument in Roscommon as well. But my favourite one, not surprisingly, is the one in Moat. And the reason is that the railings, the metal railings around the Moat monument were made by a blacksmith, Tommy Sloan, who was the nephew of Patrick Sloan, who had been shot 50 years earlier in Ballykingler. So there's a lovely family connection there. Uh, other monuments, you have the paintings uh, of Ballykingler with Tormey and Sloan's name on them in the National Museum. In Athlone Town, you have Tormey Villas, which of course is named after uh, James Tormey. Uh, in St. Patrick's Church in Moat, uh, up to the 1960s or early 70s, the altar rails of marble uh, were erected following a public subscription following the death of the Tormey brothers to collect money to put up some suitable memorial. Uh, and the Irish priest decided the most suitable memorial would be marble altar rails. But unfortunately, after Vatican II, with the redesign of churches, those rails were taken out and they're gone. So that's a pity. But I suppose the, the best, the most poignant uh, way of memorizing people is through song. Uh, and there are songs about the Tormey brothers. Uh, one of them was written by their father, Peter Tormey. And he published it in the Westmead Examiner in 1922. So it was shortly after these events. And he called it the Brothers Tormy. And to be honest with you, um, I've never heard it sung, but reading the words, it's not terribly well written. Um, but nonetheless, it exists, and that's what's important about it. But then secondly, you have the Ballad of James Tormy, which is a song that is still sung. I have heard it sung in most. Uh, over the years. Um, it's a song basically about the life and death of James Tormey. Uh, and there are many songs like it around Ireland relating to the War of Independence. But obviously, this is one uh, that is, is very special uh, to the people of Morton, to the Tormey family, and so on. My name it is James Tormey, and in Westmeat I was raised. To help to free my country, I never was afraid. And when she was in trouble, I rallied to her call. And many an English black and tan before me he did fall. 